and we can see that in the atomic structures as well. This is a ball and spoke model of the same atomic structure of clay that we've just constructed. These are oxygen silica tetrahedra. These are water and aluminum atoms and here are oxygen silicon tetrahedra again. These rather distracting connecting rods are simply to hold the model together. They're not atomic bonds such as these links are. So what we have then, we have one of those sandwiches. Oxygen silicon tetrahedra sandwich and an aluminum water sandwich. And here then the bottom of another sandwich. And nothing holding the layers together. Now that structure is similar to mica. Let's compare the ball and spoke models. The mica structure, or the muscovite mica structure, you may remember. The essential point are the connecting atoms between the sheets. These atoms here, potassium atoms. And here are the sheets. One there, and then another one with its top down up, up here. And there the connecting atoms. The structure of the clay can be compared with that structure of the muscovite mica quite closely. This layer and this layer compare with one another. This layer and this layer compare with one another. The essential difference is that the potassium atoms that are present in the mica are missing in the clay. And that is a good hint that we can very easily make clay from mica because we've already seen that potassium atoms are very soluble in potash or potassium feldspar. So if we can lose them in the feldspar, we can lose them in the mica too. So in fact, we've got two sources in the granite for clay, dominantly feldspar because it's the most important mineral, but also mica. An important process in the production of the clay was the solution of the potassium atoms and some oxygen silicon tetrahedra. Now, in the case of the mica and the, the feldspar, the solution was not complete. But in some kinds of chemical weathering, the solution of the mineral is quite complete. Let's have a look at an example of that. This piece of limestone is formed dominantly of the mineral calcite. And what happens to it when it's subjected to rain can be simulated in the laboratory using an artificial rainstorm. In other words, a shower head. Time-lapse photography shows what happens to this piece of limestone when it rains. The calcite, which makes up the limestone, dissolves totally. That's the first mineral that we've come across which is totally lost in solution. And it's lost in solution because the water that falls on the surface of the earth, the rainwater, is slightly acid. It's in fact carbonic acid formed by the combination of water in the form of rain and carbon dioxide which is in the atmosphere. And that's what makes solution such a very, very important process in weathering. The slightly acidic quality of rainwater and groundwater. If this were a glass of the water which had passed over that limestone, it would be rich in calcium and rich in carbonate ions. If it had also passed over a granitic terrain, as we've seen, it would be rich in potassium. And if it had passed over other rotting rocks, it would be rich in other elements. And where do those elements go? Do they go to the sea? and just stay in the sea because that of course is the end point for all water. Well, they get there, but they don't just stay in solution. They are the source of 
sedimentary rocks like this. This limestone formed of coral fragments could not have been produced if calcium had not been dissolved on land, carried to the sea, and there been available for organisms to precipitate as part of their skeleton. Similarly, this salt was produced from sodium and chlorine that was dissolved in land waters and then carried to the sea. This gypsum, calcium sulfate, has the same origin. So that's the fate, or the destiny, if you like, of material which is dissolved during weathering. They form sedimentary rocks from ocean water. Now, solution is a very important process, as you've seen. We've met it in all the weathering changes that we've come across. But there's one mineral that it hardly affects at all, and that's this one. These are tiny grains of quartz, forming a quartz sand. And eventually, if that sand becomes cemented together, it will form a quartz sandstone. Quartz is hardly affected at all by solution, but this sandstone doesn't escape solution. As you can see, the grains of this sandstone, once cemented together by calcium carbonate, are becoming disaggregated because solution has affected the cement between the grains. And it's the differential effect of solution on the cement between the grains which produces this rather spectacular rock. It's important when considering weathering to realize that what we're looking at is, if you like, a low temperature, low pressure reaction chamber on the surface of the Earth which recombines into new minerals, those minerals which were formed under great temperature and pressure beneath the surface of the Earth. Those minerals reach the surface because of the movement of lithospheric plates, allowing volcanic action and allowing molten rock to well to the surface. Even most of the gases in the atmosphere which those minerals react with were derived from volcanic activity, uh, all except the oxygen which was produced by plants. But even that oxygen was produced from carbon dioxide, probably largely from volcanoes. So what we're looking at, in fact, when we look at weathering, is a low temperature, low pressure reaction chamber that succeeds a high pressure, high temperature reaction chamber.